Wonderful. Well, friends, I want to welcome you to Bethel Church. Thank you for coming out here tonight. We're very excited to host a, a pretty unique event. I was telling Shabira and David that I've never done this before. So I'm, I'm excited for something that I've never done before and, and participated in where we're hosting a dialogue between a leader from the Muslim community and a leader from the Christian community who are going to uh, answer a question for us in a, in a pretty formal uh, environment. We've given each speaker 20 minutes to make a, a presentation and then they're each going to have 12 minutes, 8 minutes, and then 5 minutes. During the presentation, you'll notice there will be a slide that tells you where you can text a question. And we're asking that all the questions stay within the topic that we've chosen for tonight about how the Quran views the Christian scriptures. So as they're, as they're making presentations, if you have a question about their presentation, would, would you please consider that, that your questions need to be within that realm, that playground, so we're all agreeing to play in the same, in the same playground. And then for some of you who are in more of an analog, non-digital world, if you have a scrap of paper and you want to write a question down, uh, Jacob's agreed that he'll receive those questions there. And we have a panel of four people, two representing a Christian worldview and two representing a Muslim worldview. They have to all four agree that it's a question that we should then ask these two gentlemen to answer. And we're really looking forward to this. And, and you'll hear me appear after the formalized presentations. I'll be asking those guys questions down here from a, a different laptop that allows us all to communicate really well. I want to thank uh, Shabir Ali and David Wood for joining us tonight. It's really a, an honor to have both of you gentlemen here. I want to say thank you to our, our local mosque here in Fargo. I know they've promoted this very well. And thank you to the NDSU Muslim Student Association. A number of you have helped get this event here. I want to especially thank uh, Sajid and Jacob for your efforts to bring these gentlemen here. It was about a month ago that these two office mates at NDSU were having a conversation and just had this sense that they would like to pull off an event like this. And uh, here in this environment, that's not always easy to do. And so we're just thankful for your vi shared vision to do this, gentlemen. And thank you for allowing us to be the host. And we're looking forward uh, to what will happen tonight. David Wood will be uh, starting off, and I'm going to set a timer him for, for him here, and here we go. Well, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Jacob and Kelly, uh, Mustafa, Sajid, the Muslim Students Association, Ignite Church, Chi Alpha, Crew, InterVarsity, and the Navigators for arranging our debate tonight, and Bethel Church for hosting. Uh, there's a depressing trend that's uh, been spreading in America over the past few decades, a trend that says if we want to get along with each other, we have to avoid sensitive topics. And that, that's absolute nonsense. The only thing that happens when we avoid sensitive topics is that people never learn how to discuss sensitive topics. So when someone finally does bring up a sensitive topic, everyone loses their minds. Uh, what starts off as a uh, well-meaning principle for bringing people closer together uh, ends up bringing more division. So I'm glad that the uh, Christian and Muslim communities at North Dakota State University haven't succumbed to this disheartening trend and that they're encouraging open, honest discussion, even formal debates about our most cherished beliefs. Uh, and if we continue on this path, the path of open dialogue, I guarantee that it won't lead to uh, bitterness and hostility. It will ultimately lead to uh, friendship and understanding. Some of the best friends I've ever had, including my wife of nearly 14 years, are people I got into a heated argument with the day we met. I'd also like to thank my friend Shabir for representing the Muslim position in our seventh debate. Shabir is actually one of the people who made me want to start debating years ago. I used to uh, watch Shabir, uh, as well as his mentor, Dr. Jamal Badawi. Uh, as they took on Christianity's top apologists, and I would be sitting there watching them, thinking about how I would respond to their arguments if given, if given the opportunity. So it's, uh, it's an honor to have uh, these exchanges with Shabir. Our topic tonight is the Quran's view of the Christian scriptures. And uh, to me, this is one of the most important topics we can address, because there's a lot of confusion uh, about what the Quran says here. Most Muslims are convinced that According to the Quran, Jews and Christians corrupted our scriptures, and that this is one of the main reasons Allah sent the Quran. The Quran is supposed to correct the errors inserted into the Torah and the Gospel by Jews and Christians. But this is simply a myth. The Quran doesn't even suggest that the Torah and the Gospel are no longer reliable. 
And I say this as someone who is fully aware that Dr. Shabir Ali is going to be speaking after me and that if I'm wrong about what the Quran says here, he's going to thoroughly embarrass me by quoting all the passages from the Quran that state very clearly that the Torah and the Gospel have been corrupted. So if the Quran doesn't claim that the Torah and the Gospel have been corrupted, what is the Quran's view of the Christian scriptures? In a nutshell, the position of the Quran is that Allah sent prophets into various parts of the world and he inspired scriptures for different groups of people. These scriptures are reliable and authoritative for the groups that they were revealed to. Um, some, some members of these groups obey their scriptures and others don't. As of the early seventh century, Arabs didn't have a revelation in their own language. But these Arabs couldn't simply trust what Jews and Christians were saying about the Torah and the gospel because some Jews and Christians misinterpret and misrepresent what their texts say. So Arabs needed a revelation in Arabic. And that's why Allah sent Muhammad. Now that Arabs have the Quran, a revealed book that they can understand for themselves, they're supposed to judge by the Quran. Other groups are to judge by their own books. Jews are to judge by the Torah. Christians are to judge by the gospel. That's the position of the Quran. And it's very different from what many Muslims tell me is the position of the Quran. Uh, so don't, don't take my word for any of this. Let's go to the Quran and see if we can put together a complete picture of the true Islamic perspective on the Christian scriptures. Oh, there we go. All right, so uh, in Surah 16, verse 36, Allah says, and certainly we have raised in every nation an apostle saying, serve Allah and shun false gods. So an apostle has been sent to every nation. Arabs were the last to receive guidance. That's why Muhammad is the last of the prophets. Counting Muhammad, there are about 25 prophets mentioned uh, by name in the Quran. And we find some examples here in chapter 3, verse 84. Say, we believe in Allah and in what has been revealed to us and in what was revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes and in what was given to Moses and Jesus and the prophets from their Lord. We do not make any distinction between any of them and to him do we submit. So Muslims are required to believe in all the revelations given to all of God's prophets and messengers. But Allah didn't just send prophets. He also inspired scriptures. For instance, uh, in Surah 3, verses 3 to 4, we find that uh, in addition to the Quran, the Torah and the Gospel are inspired by Allah. He, Allah, has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it, and he revealed the Torah and the Gospel aforetime, a guidance for mankind, and he revealed the criterion. So the Torah and the Gospel were given as a guidance for mankind. Now what happened then? Did Jews corrupt the Torah? Did Christians corrupt the gospel? Not according to the Quran. The Quran claims that Jews and Christians still had the Torah and the gospel in the seventh century when Muhammad was preaching in Arabia. The Quran affirms the preservation of the Torah and the gospel in a variety of ways, some of which aren't very clear in translation. Even here in Surah 3 verses 3 to 4, for instance, where the inspiration of the Torah and the Gospel is clearly affirmed. The preservation is somewhat obscure in the English translation. The Quran is said to verify that which is before it. Now, does this mean verify before it in time? So that the Quran is only saying that the Torah and the Gospel were reliable at some point, but not necessarily uh, when the Quran is being revealed? Or does this mean something much more significant? Well, the Arabic phrase translated as before it here is baina yadehi, which literally means between his hands or between its hands, uh, and when used as an idiom, means in his presence or in its presence. So the Quran isn't merely affirming scriptures that were long gone. The Quran is affirming scriptures that are still available when Muhammad is preaching in Arabia. And the Quran uses this phrase over and over again to show that it's not talking about scriptures that are gone, it's talking about scriptures that are still present. So Surah 6, verse 92, and this, the Quran, is a blessed book which we have sent down confirming that which is bina yadehi, in its presence. 
Surah 10, verse 37, and this Quran is not such as could ever be produced by other than Allah, but it is a confirmation of that which is bayna yadehi, a confirmation of that which is in its presence, talking about previous scriptures. Surah 35, verse 31, and that which we have revealed to you of the book, that is the truth, verifying that which is bayna yadehi, again, in its presence or between its hands. Surah 46, verse 30, they said, O our people, verily we have heard a book, the Quran, sent down after Moses, verifying what is Baina Yadehi, again, in its presence. It's as if Allah is saying, how can I make it any more clear to you that I'm talking about texts that you still have that are still available as the Quran is being revealed? So since the Quran is affirming texts that still exist, it shouldn't be surprising that the Quran insists that 7th century Jews and Christians still have the Torah and the Gospel and that they're still reading it. Surah 7, verse 157. Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written down with them in the Torah and the Gospel, it is they who will prosper. We find Muhammad written down in the Torah and the Gospel. It's not possible unless we still have the Torah and the Gospel. So is this, is, this, is this only saying that there are reliable parts about Muhammad, but that other parts have been corrupted? Uh, if so, how would we know that the parts about Muhammad are the reliable parts and not the corrupted parts? In other words, what's the point of appealing to a book as a validation of your prophet if you're simultaneously claiming that that book that you're appealing to has been corrupted? Charges of corruption aside, the Quran insists that no one can change Allah's words. Surah 6, 114 to 115. Shall I then seek a judge other than Allah? And he it is who has revealed to you the book made plain. And those to whom we have given the book know that it is revealed by your Lord with truth. Therefore, you should not be of the disputers. And the word of your Lord has been accomplished truly and justly. There is none who can change his words. And he is the hearing, the knowing. There is none who can change his words. Surah 18, verse 27, and recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can alter his words, and you shall not find any refuge besides him. So according to the Quran, can Jews corrupt the Torah? Can Christians corrupt the Torah? Can the Apostle Paul corrupt the Torah or the Gospel? Uh, no one can corrupt these scriptures. Now, in case anyone thinks I, I may be misinterpreting these passages, I should point out that in Islam, Muhammad is considered the greatest interpreter of the Quran. And Muhammad certainly believed that Jews and Christians had reliable scriptures from God. Sunan Abu Dawud, 4449, this is uh, some Jews are in a dispute before Muhammad, and here's what happens. They set out a cushion for the Messenger of Allah, and he sat on it. Then he said, bring me the Torah. It was brought, and he took the cushion from beneath him and placed the Torah on it and said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. This goes way beyond affirming the initial inspiration of the Torah 2,000 years earlier. Muhammad is affirming the Torah that is with the Jews in the seventh century as the word of God. But Jews weren't the only ones who had reliable scriptures. Jamiat Termidi, 2653. We were with the prophet when he raised his sight to the sky. Then he said, this is the time when knowledge is to be taken from the people until what remains of it shall not amount to anything. So Ziyad bin Labid al-Ansari said, how will it be taken from us while we recite the Quran? By Allah, we recite it and our women and children recite it. Muhammad replies, may you be bereaved of your mother, O Ziyad. I used to consider you among the fuqaha, those are uh, Islamic jurists, of the people of al-Madina, the Torah and the Gospel are with the Jews and the Christians, but what do they avail of them? So Ziyad wants to know how knowledge can pass away from the Muslim community when they have the Quran and recite the Quran. Muhammad's response is, look at the Jews and Christians, they have the Torah and the Gospel, don't they? Muhammad's response makes no sense if he thought the Torah and the Gospel were corrupted, because he only brings up the Torah and the Gospel to show that even if you have reliable scriptures from God, this doesn't mean you're on the right track, you're not obeying them. So Muhammad certainly believed that Jews and Christians have reliable scriptures. And so if, if anyone says that Muhammad's wrong, you would be claiming to understand the, uh, the Quran better than Muhammad. Now Muhammad actually goes beyond simply affirming the inspiration and the preservation of the Torah and the gospel. He also affirms the authority of the Torah and the gospel. In chapter five, verse 43 of the Quran. 
Jews are having a dispute among, uh, in front of Muhammad, and when they bring their dispute to Muhammad, Allah replies to Muhammad, why do they come to you for judgment when they have the Torah before them? Wherein is the judgment of Allah? Yet they turn back after that, and these are not the believers. Allah says, why are they coming to you when they have the Torah? So according to the Quran, do Jews need the Quran? No. According to Muslims today, do Jews need the Quran? Of course they need the Quran because, I mean, of course they need the Torah because, I mean, of course they need the Quran because the Torah has been corrupted. So there's a difference there. Just a few verses later, we have Allah's command for the Christians. Chapter 5, verse 47, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. According to the Quran, should Christians judge by the gospel? Absolutely. It says we're rebels against Allah if we don't judge by the gospel. According to Muslims today, should we judge by the gospel? Of course not. The gospel has been corrupted. Once again, there's a difference. According to the Quran, if Jews and Christians don't judge by the Torah and the gospel, we have nowhere else to stand. Chapter 5, verse 68, say, Allah commands Muhammad to say, say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. Torah and the gospel, this is the ground that we are commanded to stand upon. But it's interesting because the Torah and the gospel are not just authoritative for Jews and Christians, they're also authoritative for Muhammad. In chapter 10 of the Quran, Muhammad is having some doubts and Allah tells him how to deal with doubts. Chapter 10, verse 94, but if you, Muhammad, are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you, certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. So if Muhammad, if you're not sure if these revelations are true, go to the people of the book for verification. What sense would that make if Jews and Christians have corrupt scriptures? The only way Muhammad's scriptures would line up with corrupt scriptures is if the Quran was also corrupt. And I've never met a Muslim who wants me to think that the Quran is corrupt. So this is presupposing that Jews and Christians have reliable scriptures. So if the Torah and the gospel are the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, why did Allah send the Quran? Well, he tells us, Surah 46, verse 12, and before this Quran was the book of Moses as a guide and a mercy, and this book, the Quran, confirms it in the Arabic language to admonish the unjust and as glad tidings to those who do right. So the, the Quran affirms the Torah in Arabic. Why Arabic? So that uh, Arabs would have a revelation that they can understand and that Muhammad could warn the people of Mecca and Arabia. Surah 42, verse 7, And thus have we revealed to you an Arabic Quran that you may warn the mother city, Mecca, and those around it, and that you may give warning of the day of gathering together wherein is no doubt a party shall be in the garden and another party in the burning fire, that you may warn the mother city. So this is the point of the Quran, that you may warn the, the Mecca and the people around it. If Allah hadn't sent a prophet with an Arabic message, then the Arabs would have had an excuse on the Day of Judgment. So we read here, Surah 6, verses 155 to 157. And this Quran is a book we have revealed as a blessing. Therefore, follow it and guard against evil, that mercy may be shown to you. Lest you should say, the book was only revealed to two parties before us, and we were truly unaware of what they read. Or lest you should say, if the book had been revealed to us, we would certainly have been better guided than they. So the Quran is revealed so that Arabs don't have an excuse on the day of judgment. Now, this is interesting because my Muslim friends tell me that the Quran is the book that's for everybody now and that it can only be understood in Arabic. Now, if the reason the Quran was revealed according to the Quran itself was so that a particular group of people would have a revelation in their own language so that they can understand it in their own language, what sense does it make to say that this book is now the book for all people, even people who don't understand the language and therefore can't understand it? So the Quran's view, both of itself and of the Jewish and Christian scriptures, is very different from what I find among uh, many Muslims today. 
Now, that's about all I can pack into uh, an opening statement. My time is, is almost up. Uh, but as this debate moves forward, there are a few additional issues that we'll need to, uh, to address. Um, for instance, um, there are several passages in the Quran where Jews are being accused of concealing what's in the Torah or even of uh, falsifying a description of Muhammad and claiming that it's from God. Uh, some Muslims think that these passages are talking about the corruption of the Torah, so we may need to look at those. Um, also, many Muslims are convinced that the gospel, the Injil in Arabic, is a book that Jesus delivered to his followers. Now, Jesus didn't believe, deliver a book to his followers, but many people think that he did, and so we may need to address that. Um, and finally, since the Quran, I mean, since the, the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the gospel, um, which in the seventh century was a term when used of a book, was used to refer to the collection of the four New Testament gospels as a unit. Uh, since the Quran affirms that, there is some question of what's the status of other New Testament books, such as the letters of Paul. So um, Shabir can decide which direction we, want, we need to go. But uh, I'll just conclude with a quotation from Abdullah Saeed, uh, professor of Arab and, uh, Arab and Islamic studies at the University of Melbourne, who writes, since the authorized scriptures of Jews and Christians remain very much today as they existed at the time of the prophet, it is difficult to argue that the Quranic references to Torah and Injil, Torah and Gospel, were only to the pure Torah and Injil as existed at the time of Moses and Jesus respectively. If the texts have remained more or less as they were in the 7th century CE, the reverence the Quran has shown them at the time should be retained even today. Many interpreters of the Quran, from Tabari to Razi to Ibn Taymiyyah and even to Qutb, appear to be inclined to share this view. The wholesale dismissive attitude held by many Muslims in the modern period towards the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity do not seem to have the support of either the Quran or the major figures of tafsir. So my hope uh, for the Muslims here and for those watching later is that they will come to have the same reverence for the Torah and the gospel that we find in, uh, in the Quran and in the teachings of Muhammad. Hello everyone, uh, I begin by praising and thanking our creator and fashioner. I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers. I ask him to bless all of us here tonight, uh, all of you men, women, and children. Bless uh, you and your loved ones, uh, and uh, I ask him to give us happiness and prosperity in this life, and everlasting happiness uh, under the shade of his mercy and guidance and love in the life hereafter. I want to thank all of the people who are responsible for um, getting me here and making this all possible. I want to thank uh, Jacob and uh, Pastor Jonas uh, for hosting this event uh, here and all of the administrators uh, of this mosque. I feel honored uh, of this church. I feel uh, honored uh, to uh, be speaking in, in such a beautiful, well-designed, uh, spacious, airy uh, church. And uh, I want to thank uh, those from the Muslim community, uh, Mustafa, who invited me, and Sajid from the MSA uh, for their work in bringing me here. I want to thank David for uh, sharing this uh, platform uh, with me and for saying some kind words uh, about me and my participation in such uh, dialogues. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming out uh, here and uh, giving us uh, uh, such an atmosphere in which we can project uh, our thoughts. I want to go straight to my presentation on, on the topic. Uh, what does the Quran uh, say about the Christian scriptures? What is the Quran's view? Uh, Pastor, I, I don't see it up yet. Oh, so to the right, okay, next. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let me move on then. I, I want us tonight to put our heads together in a friendly way, not butting heads, but uh, le let's, let's try to understand the topic at hand. And David has uh, given a wonderful presentation. I want to continue along uh, the same lines, though obviously I'm no match uh, for him, either for height or handsomeness or um, <laughs> um, decorum in his speech. But uh, now to continue, I want to draw your attention to a statement which I found uh, on the website of this very uh, church, Bethel uh, Church in Fargo, where it says, we believe the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, to be the inspired word of God without error in the original writings. 
Now, I want to say that uh, Muslims and Christians do have something in common, even uh, when we come to speak of this topic, because you notice uh, the, the curious statement at the end in the original writings. Uh, many Christians do say it that way, and uh, the reason for saying it this way is that uh, it is sometimes recognized that perhaps there are errors in the Bibles that we hold today, but the Christian affirmation now is that the uh, original writings are without error. In fact, Muslims are saying something similar. When Muslims speak about the Torah and the Injil, uh, and when the Quran speaks about the Torah and the Injil, Muslims believe, uh, and, and the Quran speaks about them as, uh, as if they are pure scriptures, uh, the, often that is uh, a reference to the Torah and Injil as they were originally not the ones that we hold in our hands today. So that's the distinction. So we can, uh, as much as Christians would respect the Bible as they have it today, uh, and yet think theoretically, well, it's the original scriptures that are the uh, inspired uh, word of God and, and free from all error, of course, what you hold in your hands today is, 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 has a, a great relationship with those original uh, documents. And that's why you have some reverence and respect for the ones you hold in your hands today. But when push comes to shove, uh, one falls back on the idea that it is the original writings. And so too, Muslims would speak respectfully about the Bible, should speak res respectfully about the Bible. Uh, but if, if they're pushed, they may have to say, well, you know, what we really mean is that the originals were revealed by God, and we now have to look at the transmission history to see to what extent the Bibles today retain that original message from God as it once was. So seeing that commonality, I move on now uh, to an interesting book, which I believe to be a game changer in Islamic studies. For a long time, many academic scholars had said very much uh, what David had said today. And in fact, so many of them have said it that even Abdullah Saeed has been persuaded by it. And for a time, I myself was being inclined to that position as well, to think that it looks like the Quran is actually affirming uh, the Torah and the, the, the gospel as it existed at the time when the Quran was being revealed in all its totality. However, uh, this book by Sidney Griffith, who is uh, a modern scholar on the religion of Islam, though he does not seem to be a Muslim himself, he has written uh, this book and many articles published in academic uh, journals in which he does say two things. Uh, so the title of the book, for those who might be listening and perhaps not be able to see the slide for whatever reason, uh, The Bible in Arabic. That is the title of the book by Sidney Griffith. Now, uh, he says two things. Uh, one is that the Bible, according to the Quran, has been changed. And two, according to the Quran again, the, the Quran's view is that the Quran is restoring the original Bible stories. The Quran is telling us the way it should be understood. That's the Quran's view, not Sidney Griffith's view, but he's saying that these two things are clear from the Quran. One, that the Quran is affirming that the Bible has been changed, and two, that the Quran is affirming, uh, or at least put positioning itself as presenting the stories of the Bible all over again, but the way the stories should be understood. So let's uh, continue and look at more details. Uh, David has given us many examples uh, of uh, where the Quran speaks respectfully about the Bible. And I, as a Muslim, I have to believe in all of those verses of the Quran. But as a Muslim, I have to believe in the entire Quran, not only on those verses, but on any topic. Uh, I have to comb the entire Quran to find everything the Quran says about the topic at hand. And then I have to amalgamate all of those statements together and form a conclusion. So now, those are, on the one hand, positive statements about the Bible, but there are also some, uh, unfortunately, some negative statements. And here we find, for example, a, a, a statement from the Quran which would indicate that it, some changes have occurred in the Old Testament, more specifically in the Torah, uh, where it says, for example, in the second chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, from the 75th to 79th uh, verse. So the 75th uh, verse uh, says uh, that there have been people in the past from among those people of the book, apparently a reference here to Jews, uh, who uh, had heard the word of God, 
uh, and then يُحَرِّفُونَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا قَلُوهُ they, they changed the, the words after they had uh, understood it. So this is like some deliberate changes that, according to the Quran, have entered into the Old Testament scriptures. And then the 79th verse says, So woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands and then say that it is uh, from God in, in order to uh, benefit from it a trifling in this world. Uh, Pastor, I don't see my time. Uh, I have to keep track of time so I don't go over here um, because I can get excited and speak all night, right? Okay, uh, so uh, then he, he, let's go to a passage now that deals with uh, apparently the New Testament. So changes to the New Testament, more specifically uh, regarding the gospel of Jesus on whom be peace. Because as uh, David pointed out, uh, Muslims may be hesitant to accept the writings of Paul because whereas the Quran speaks about the Injil and we connect that to, to gospel, gospel of Jesus, uh, there's nothing in the Quran that seems to affirm uh, the validity of the teachings and writings of St. Paul. Uh, so more to, to, to the uh, teachings of Jesus then, uh, in the third chapter of the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, in the 78 uh, verse, the Quran says, There are some who twist their tongues with the scripture, so that you will think that it is part of the scripture, but it is not part of the scripture. Now, one might think that this is just referring to reading it wrong, uh, but uh, there are two issues here that should be mentioned. One is that, uh, in fact, some uh, interpretive process goes into the reading, both of the Old Testament and of the New Testament. The early uncial manuscripts of the New Testament are written without spaces between words. Uh, so to the Old Testament in, in Hebrew, and one has to have some interpretive uh, faculty going at the same time when one is reading. So reading is very much connected with interpretation, whereas today, when we read our English Bibles, first you read it the way it says, and then you start interpreting. But with the ancient scriptures, you have to start interpreting before you actually pronounce what you are reading. To give an example of this, some scholars have pointed out to, uh, to, that if English were written such that there are no spaces between words, some confusion could occur, and, and you have to decide how to read. For example, the same statement that says God is now here, with the right spaces, if the spaces are shifted, the same statement could be read as God is nowhere. So, so some interpretation uh, is involved. But what is more telling is that the 79th verse here uh, says uh, and declares quite emphatically that it is not possible for a person who has been given the scripture and the wisdom from God that that person should then say to people, uh, be worshipers of me instead of being worshipers of God. So this seems to be a very clear reference to Jesus because in the same surah earlier on, Jesus was said to be given not only the scripture but also the wisdom and uh, he is obviously a prophet. And the 80th verse continues along the same lines by saying that it is not possible uh, that uh, some uh, such uh, person, a human being like Jesus, uh, I'm saying like Jesus, that's my interpretation of this passage, uh, that such a person uh, would be telling people uh, to take them as lords uh, uh, in addition to or other than, than God. So we do have then a combination of two things. On the one hand, positive statements about the uh, Jewish and Christian scriptures, but on the other hand, also some statements which indicate that there has been some change. So Muslims would now have to put these all together and say, yes, the Quran is speaking respectfully about the scriptures of the other faiths, but at the same time, cautioning us that not everything in it uh, is uh, 100%, and and what we should really be affirming is that the originals are the inspired and, and true and, and without error. And to the extent that the present Bibles have been transmitted uh, accurately, those also would bear the marks of inspiration and authority and uh, acceptance. Now to continue then, 
Look at this passage from the Quran in Surah 7, verse number 157. Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written with them in the Torah and the Injil. So we can say Torah and gospel for the last statement there. The important thing I wanted to point out is the statement whom they find, whom they find. You notice that this statement is not so much directed at Muslims and telling Muslims, you go to the Old Testament and New Testament and you will find Muhammad written there. It is saying that this is what the, the, the people of the book will find. Those who have been reading the Bible, they will find uh, Muhammad mentioned uh, there. Now, this uh, passage has created a lot of confusion in the minds of, of people who think and that it's not so much that the passage is at fault, but people are reading into it, and they're thinking that they're supposed to find Muhammad mentioned, for example, by name, and that there should be some very clear and indisputable indications about him in the previous scriptures. But to me, this is not what the Quran is saying. The Quran, to me, in this passage, is calling on Jews and Christians to use the interpretive methods with which they are already familiar to see if those interpretive methods would point them towards Muhammad as it has already pointed the Christians, as, as those interpretive methods have already pointed the Christians to Jesus. So, uh, what have methods of Christians in particular used? They have used uh, typology. They have said that Jesus uh, is not mentioned in the Old Testament by name, but we can see that he fulfills some types of things which were going on in the Old Testament. So there were sacrifices, now Jesus becomes the ultimate sacrifice. They use the idea of the fuller sense of Scripture. They say that something was mentioned there, but it would not have been understood at the time. But when Jesus came, that's when it, become, it became very clear, and he's bringing out now the fuller sense of Scripture. They use also Midrash. I know Christians don't think of themselves as doing this today, but the New Testament writers like Matthew and others, they have actually done this. What they have done then is that they have looked at an Old Testament passage and they have said in advance of Jesus arriving on the scene that there is going to be a Messiah coming. No particular scripture said that here and now a Messiah will come and his name will be Jesus, but they are looking at certain clues in the Old Testament and they are seeing that that is fulfilled in Jesus. Moreover, they use a, a, an interpretive method known as Pesher, where they take Jesus as he is and then they go back to the Old Testament to see if perhaps there is some sort of indication, no matter how vague, about this man that we know to be Jesus. So to me, the Quran is really asking Jews and Christians, use these methods with which you are already familiar and with which you have already, for example, uh, identified Jesus as a, a man of God, prophet, and, and Messiah of God. And even to the extent that Christians have said that Jesus is the Son of God, the Quran is saying, if you have used those methods to identify Jesus, what prevents you then from using the same methods and recognizing that Muhammad is a prophet and a messenger from God, and that there are indications of this in the Old and also in the New Testament? If we have time, we will look at some details of this. But uh, just to give you some brief overview, uh, what is found in the Torah? Uh, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 18, there as a mention of a prophet to come after Moses. And uh, some biblical scholars, for example, in the New Jerome Biblical Commentary, it is said that this means that there will be a prophet coming at every time when one is needed. Well, if one looks at Islamic history, one sees that there was a period of jahiliyyah, a time of ignorance, and then the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came at that opportune time to give the light and message of God to the people who were plunged in ignorance and darkness and idolatry and all kinds of uh, wickedness. Now, in the New Testament, we find also indications because Jesus, on whom be peace, spoke of someone to come after him. And John the Baptist spoke about someone to come after himself who is greater than John the Baptist. And we notice in the New Testament that Jesus himself declared that John the Baptist is greater than Jesus. I know that Christians might find that hard to accept, but this is what the New Testament actually says, that Jesus said this. And if you put the pieces together, if John the Baptist is greater than Jesus, and 
the one to come in the future is greater than John the Baptist, then the one to come in the future is not John the Baptist, neither is he Jesus. If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then therefore A is greater than C and A is not equal to C. So if John the Baptist is called B here and C, Christ is called C, and John the Baptist is speaking about one to come after him, let's call him Ahmed for the moment, uh, even prejudging that conclusion, uh, just to use that A for Ahmed, then Ahmed A is greater than B, John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is greater than C, the Christ, and therefore the one to come in the future, that Ahmed, is not the Christ, but one greater uh, than the Christ. I just have two minutes uh, remaining, so I want to continue and finish this up. Now, uh, lastly, I want to mention that there are some Quranic verses which are being misunderstood in this respect, and uh, uh, David has mentioned some of them, and uh, I have actually clocked them here ahead of time. Uh, in uh, Surah 5, verse number 47, where the Christians are being asked to judge by their Injil, it does not mean that the Injil uh, is the final thing for Christians to judge with. Uh, moreover, it is not saying judge by all of the Injil, as if you are to accept everything therein, but it says judge by that which God has revealed therein. And then the statement continues to say, Whoever does not judge by what God has revealed. Now it's very general. It could mean the Injil and the Torah, but also the Quran, which is being revealed to them. Uh, David was uh, saying that uh, the Quran is indicating that the Torah and the Injil are sufficient for the Jews and Christians, but rather, in Surah 5, verses number 15 and also verse number 19, there are clear indications that now the Quran has also been revealed to the people of the book, the Jews and Christians, and they too are required to follow the Quran. In fact, Surah 4, verse number 47, warns them of dire consequences if they will not now follow this revelation that comes from God. And that makes sense. Because the Deuteronomy verse, chapter 18, verse number 19, says, When I send that prophet, you must listen to him, otherwise I will require it of you. So everybody has to listen to the prophet who comes from God and the new message which has come from God. Uh, Jews and Christians are required then to use the interpretive processes to find out uh, what they can still follow of the Torah and the gospel and to find out what is really original and what is not. But ultimately they are required if they hear the message of the Quran to follow that as well. That is the Quranic logic. As for 1094... That passage is only taken out of context to give the meaning that David uh, wanted to portray. But if we read 10 verses later, uh, we will see that uh, the, the, Muhammad is being told to address those who may have doubts. It's not that he himself has doubts. In fact, the same verse continues by saying, you should not have any doubts. So God is assuring him. Uh, it's not so much that he should go and beg from the people of the book, but he should correct them. As for the last verse, and no one changes the words of God, that's only the decree of God, not the written text of Scripture, and I end with that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shabir. Um, in my opening statement, I argued that the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Christian Scriptures. I don't think there's any disagreement between uh, Shabir and me on the inspiration of the Torah and the gospel. So it seems that our discussion will focus on issues relating to preservation and authority. Now Shabir says that when the Quran speaks favorably of our scriptures, it's referring, it's referring to the original writings. But I pointed out several uh, problems with that, namely that the Quran repeatedly refers to the scriptures that are bina yadehi, in its presence. Um, Shabir, uh, cites Sidney Griffith and says that he argues, uh, one, that, the, that according to the Quran, the Bible has been changed, and two, that the Quran is restoring the Bible. But he didn't give us any evidence except for what he actually presented, so I'm actually going to focus on the evidence that Shabir presented. Now, Shabir argues that uh, Surah 2, verses 79, I mean, verses 75 to 79, show that the Bible has been changed according to the Quran. Now we must be reading this very differently because I don't even think it's remotely possible that this passage is referring to 
uh, corruption of the Torah and the gospel. Um, I should point out that as far as uh, verse 79 is concerned, it doesn't say who is writing what. It doesn't, it doesn't define who it's talking about. If you go to the verse before it, which is 78, it talks about illiterate people who don't know the book. They're illiterate in, in the sense of uneducated. So it's not clear what, pe what these people would damage, what damage these people could do. They're not, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're not authorities. So they're scribbling something down. Uh, what is this? Well, in order to put this on the Jews and say this is referring to Jews, you go back to uh, verse 75. Um, and there we find that people are distorting and misrepresenting the text. It doesn't say anything about uh, actually uh, corrupting the text. Uh, there you go to 79, it says, woe to those who write the books with their hands and claim that this is from Allah. So uh, is this claiming that the Torah has been corrupted? Uh, well, I, I would just point out, first of all, that if this is talking about corruption, then we, have, we simply have a contradiction on our hands. If the Quran repeatedly um, tells Jews to judge by the Torah and affirms the Torah, then saying that the Torah is corrupt would mean we have a contradiction on our hands. Um, next, since Muhammad affirmed the, author the authority of the Torah in the possession of the Jews of his time, that's what he does in chapter 5, verse 43, and remember, Muhammad says, Muhammad says, uh, he believes in the Torah that was in the possession of the Jewish community of his time. That's in Sunan Abu Dawud. Um, if we assume that the Quran is referring to Jews in 279, um, we can't ignore the fact that it's only certain Jews here. If, if the subject here is the, the Jews of chapter 2, verse 75, it says a party of the Jews. Let me read it. Chapter 2, verse 75. Do you then hope that they would believe in you and a party from among them indeed used to hear the word of Allah, then altered it after they had understood it and they know this. So there's a party of them who distort it. And by the way, other passages, um, including one of the ones that Shabir uh, quoted, talk about them distorting with their tongue. So again, we have to go to 79 if we want to say it's some sort of textual corruption, but that's not going to work. Uh, one important thing here is that other passages of the Quran talk about Jews who will not sell the revelations of God in this way. Um, so for instance, chapter 7, verse 159, uh, says that of the people of the Moses, there is a party who guide and do justice in the light of truth. Now think about that. It's saying, oh, there's, there's a party over there, and they're writing some sort of text or something like that. Well, it says there's, there's a party who won't do that. There's a, there's a faithful party. So how do you say that the unfaithful party, they managed to get all the scriptures corrupted, and the, the faithful party, who the Quran says are up at night quoting, quoting the revelations of God, they, they don't manage to preserve the Torah. Um, according, uh, apart from all of this, uh, Shabir knows this. Shabir knows that according to Muslim commentators, we have some ideas about what this is about. Uh, you have one story about Jews who um, didn't want people to believe in Muhammad, and so they, uh, they wrote a false description of him and said that this is from the Torah. By the way, how would that corrupt the Torah? If I write something right now and I say, this is from the Quran, how have I corrupted the Quran? I could write something right now. I could walk over and insert it in my Quran. Have I corrupted the Quran? No. Why? Because there are Qurans all over the world. Guess what? The same is true of the Torah. If someone says, I don't like Muhammad, I'm going to write a false description of him and claim that it's from God, that hasn't corrupted the Torah. There are Jewish communities across North, there were, in this time, there were Jewish communities across Northern Africa and in Europe and across the Middle East. You could, you, you could completely alter one whole entire Torah. That's not even what's claimed here. It's just saying, hey, they said this is from God. So there's no way that this could even possibly corrupt the Torah around the world. Now, even if, even if we argued that somehow someone writing something and saying, this is from God, would somehow magically affect Jewish communities around the world, guess what? We have copies of the Torah before this, right? We dig them up. You have the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're long before this. So a, a Jew of this time could corrupt all the Torah he wanted, it wouldn't change the Torah that is buried somewhere. And guess what, by this time, Christians also had the Torah. They had it as part of the Bible. So if you wanna say that someone writing in Arabia to get people not to believe in Muhammad is somehow corrupting copies of the Torah around the world in the hands of Jews and Christians, 
Uh, that, I would say that goes a bit beyond magic there. Um, by the way, if, if you just keep reading the passage, one of the most important principles of scripture, read, keep reading the passage. Just a few verses after this, in chapter 2, verse 85, so Shabir quoted up through 79. If you go to verse 85 of the same chapter, Allah condemns people who reject parts of the, who reject parts of the Torah and refuse to follow all of it. Allah asks, do you then believe in a part of the book and, dis, and disbelieve in the other? But what are we being told right now? Yes, just believe in parts of the Torah and disbelieve in other parts. That's exactly what Allah, that's very strange for Allah to condemn people who only believe in parts of the Torah when, according to Shabir, that's the message of the Quran, just believe in parts of the Torah. Uh, by the way, in the same passage, Surah 2, verses 91 and verse 101, the Quran specifically says, again, it's confirming the scriptures with the Jews. It says it's confirming what is with you. Very strange if in verse 79, he's saying your, your Torah has been corrupted. And by the way, if the Torah has been corrupted by the time we get to Surah 2, then obviously years later when we get to Surah 5 and Jews come to Muhammad for judgment, the response should have been, it's about time they came to you for judgment because their scriptures have been corrupted. Instead, Allah says, why are they coming to you for judgment when they have the Torah? And if you look at the, the symbolism involved and what Muhammad did in that, he sits on the cushion that is the judgment cushion. He says, bring me the Torah. Muhammad gets off the judgment seat, puts the Torah on the judgment seat. Who's the judge? The, the Torah is the judge, according to Muhammad and according to the Quran. But we're being told, no, only parts of it are reliable and the Quran insists that it's corrupted. Now, that's one passage Shabir cited to show that according to the Quran, the Bible has been corrupted. The other passage was um, chapter 3, verses 78 to 80. And that passage begins, most surely there is a party among them who distort the book with their tongue. It's about people who are saying one thing, and we find this over and over again in the Quran. There are many passages like this that say we're, uh, we're distorting the meaning, we're distorting uh, what these passages mean. But again, the Quran says that just a few verses later, there are people of the book who don't do this. So that's uh, chapter 3, verses 78 to 80. I'll read chapter 3, verses 113 to 115, same chapter, just a little later. They are not all alike. Of the followers of the book, there is an upright party. They recite Allah's communications in the nighttime, and they adore him. They believe in Allah and the last day, and they enjoin what is right and forbid the wrong, and they thrive and strive with one another in hastening to good deeds, and those are among the good. And whatever good they do, they shall not be denied it, and Allah knows those who guard against evil. Now, th think about this. If you find something that's criticizing certain people of the book, and you say, ah, that means they corrupted their scriptures. And just a, a few verses later, it says, oh, and by the way, they're not all like that. They're really good ones. Well, I mean, you can say that of any community, right? You can say that of, of Jews, of Christians, of Muslims. You can say, hey, there, here's some really bad ones who don't follow their scriptures. You can say, oh, here are really good ones who do follow their scriptures. If you say, if there are bad ones, then their scriptures are corrupted, then that would apply to any scriptures that have ever been possessed by uh, bad people. Uh, concerning preservation, um, I gave several arguments. Shabir responded to my quotation of Surah 7, verse 157. Um, Shabir says that the Quran's only telling us, Jews and Christians, to use the interpretive methods that we use in examining prophecies about Jesus. Well, the Quran doesn't say what it means. All we have to go on is the early Muslim community, and they did pretty much what Muslims do today. They tried to show from the Old Testament or from the New Testament that uh, Muhammad was prophesied. Um, I don't know what this has to do with, um, with the Quran's view of the scriptures, because once again, it's appealing to uh, our scriptures as evidence. It doesn't make sense if our scriptures are corrupted. Um, so I quoted multiple hadith where uh, Muhammad is affirming scriptures as they existed in his time. Uh, Shabir responds and says, the Quran says to judge by what Allah has revealed, as far as the uh, chapter 5, verse 47. Chapter 5, verse 47. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. It's not telling us to judge by the gospel, according to Shabir. It's all of Allah's revelation. Well, keep in mind, this is the same passage where Allah says, why are the Jews coming to you for judgment when they have the Torah? If right after this, he says to the Christian, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. And then in the very next verse, he talks about Muslims having the Torah that they judge by. How is that any different from what I said in my opening statement? That God sent different 
uh, different prophets into the world and that he gave revelations to different groups of people and that Jews have their revelation that they have to judge by, that Christians have their revelation that they have to judge by, and that Muslims have their revelations that they have to judge by. Um, there's, there's no way around this un unless you just start inserting meanings into various texts. And notice, Shabir quoted two passages of the Quran to show that the, the Torah and the gospel have been corrupted. Neither one of them say anything about the Torah and the gospel being corrupted. And we can assume that he came with the strongest. Thank you, David, for that uh, interesting and engaging uh, response. Now, David mentioned in his opening presentation the third chapter of the Quran, uh, the third to fifth uh, uh, verse, uh, where it uh, says that God had revealed the Torah and the gospel and then revealed the criterion. I don't know if you remember that verse. Criterion in Arabic is Furqan, and that is a reference here to the Quran itself. And Furqan in Arabic, criterion in English, is that which differentiates between the right and the wrong the truth and the falsehood. So as if in that very verse uh, that David quoted in his favor, uh, the Quran is saying that God has revealed previous scriptures, but now he has revealed the decisive one. A and this is what Muslims are looking at, the Quran as the decisive uh, scripture to differentiate between truth uh, and uh, falsehood. Uh, the passages of the Quran which speak uh, of uh, the Quran uh, verifying that which is uh, in its presence by using the term min bayni yadayhi, as uh, David has uh, cited many passages of the Quran to show, it does not contradict with what the Muslim position holds, because the Muslim position is not that the Bible that is present even today is totally false. No, rather, the Muslim position is that we basically respect and believe that the Bible contains revealed messages from God, but we are cautious about certain passages of the Bible, especially when, for example, there are passages which seem to indicate that Jesus told people uh, to take him uh, as uh, a God along with God. Uh, so, for example, if we think of uh, John chapter 14, verse uh, uh, 28, where uh, Jesus says that uh, the Father is greater than I, Muslims would say, yeah, well, you know, the Father greater than Jesus. That makes sense. But for Jesus to have called God Father, this is where Muslims might hesitate because we don't have anything in our tradition that says that Jesus actually called God Father or we should refer to God in that way. Uh, so we accept uh, what is clearly in conformity with the final revelation from God, but uh, we have doubts about the transmission process through which many other passages have uh, uh, come to us in the forms that they do. Uh, so the Quran is on the one hand uh, affirming the truth of the scriptures as they were before the Quran and even as they are present there as the Quran is being revealed, but at the same time the Quran is clarifying that there are certain passages in those previous scriptures which have suffered through the process of transmission and which should be avoided. So how do we know which parts, David is asking? Uh, well, this is for our Jewish and Christian friends to figure out, and they are trying to figure that out despite anything that the Quran says. The critical study of the New Testament text and of the Hebrew text of the uh, Old Testament scriptures, this is going on despite anything that Muslims have to say. Muslim, uh, Christian, and Jewish scholars themselves are interested in differentiating between that which was originally the Word of God and that which later on resulted from errors in transmission. And of course, many Christians recognize that that's why this church could say on its website, we believe that the scriptures are inspired in the original autographs, not so much the ones that we hold in our hands today. Uh, now, uh, David refer, re responds to my claim that Surah 2, verses 79, 75 to 79, uh, speaks of the Torah being corrupted. And he says, well, how could you know, one person writing the scripture result in a, in a worldwide corruption of the Torah? And I must concede that, uh, that both passages that I have mentioned, and I indicated this in my previous uh, presentation as well, they do not speak decisively uh, to say we are re referring to this particular scripture. 
It is an interpretation that we apply to that text. This is how it appears to us. But to me, it is the best interpretation of this text given whatever else the Quran says. Given the Quran's stance in reporting the stories from the Bible, but giving a corrected version of the story. Maybe I should give a couple of quick examples of this. In the Annunciation to Mary, in Luke's Gospel, the angel says to her, uh, in, in response to our question, how can I have a child? Uh, the angel says, the spirit of the Most High will overshadow you, and thus that which will be born in you will be called the Son of God. Now, this gives the impression uh, on the surface as if God takes the place of a human actor uh, in a relationship here on earth. Uh, but the Quran, reporting the same story, tells us about the Annunciation. When Mary asks, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? She is being told, this is easy for God. When God decides a matter, he only says to it, be, and it becomes. So God is removed from this kind of human interaction uh, here. Uh, of a very intimate uh, nature, the Quran has retold the story. This was Sidney Griffith's point. Uh, now, often uh, on this topic, what our Christian friends want to say to us Muslims is that, you know what, Muhammad thought that the Quran uh, is teaching the same things as the Bible because he didn't know what the Bible contained. And later on, Muslims discovered that the Bible is different, and then Muslims invented the idea that the Bible has been changed in order to protect their belief in the Quran and their belief in the integrity and truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad. But what Sidney Griffith has pointed out is that there is a high quotient of biblical knowledge in the Quran. It's not that the Quran is ignorant of the Bible. Now I'm speaking of the Quran as though it's an, an intelligent mind of its own to avoid uh, saying that God revealed this or that Muhammad wrote this. I'm taking a neutral stance here as much as possible. Now, the Quran knows those stories from the Bible, but is giving us a sanitized version of those old stories. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Open the first uh, three chapters, Genesis chapters 1 to 3. Story of the creation of Adam and of Eve and the original sin. The Quran gives us a very different take on that, even though the Quran refers to the story again and again in several chapters of the Quran. One of the differences that I have time to mention here, and I can mention many if uh, time permits, in each one of the cases you will see that the Quran is actually improving the story. Now, in the Genesis story, uh, the serpent comes and speaks to the woman and convinces her to eat from the forbidden tree. And then she saw that it was good and she gave it to her husband also and he ate. And later on in the Bible, the point is made in the New Testament that it's not the man who ate deliberately, but it's the woman who uh, deliberately ate and then gave it to her husband. So the woman is seen as the betrayer of the man. Now, in the Quran, the story is told many times, but uh, most often it says that uh, Satan whispered to the two of them. Only once in the Quran is one of the two persons singled out for mention, and that uh, one of the two persons is not Eve, but it is Adam where it says in the 20th chapter, فَوَسْوَسَلُهُ that shaitan whispered to him, that is to the man, to Adam. Never is the woman singled out for blame in the Quran. Why? The Quran is in, uh, reinterpreting and uh, uh, giving us a different version of that story. Not ignorance of the original story, but reshaping it and making it applicable for uh, our modern uh, readership. And this was 1,400 years ago. So the Quran stance is that uh, you see those stories in the Bible, they have been changed. Here is the correct story. But the Quran is doing it in a subtle way and in a way that will be palatable to its first hearers. The Quran would not have made much headway uh, by always contradicting deliberately and in a very overt way in your face, uh, the Jews and Christians. So mostly the Quran spoke favorably about their religion, about their books, and about them as individuals and persons, praising them to such an extent that Ernest Hahn, a Christian, said in one of his writings, we must ask if we Christians really deserve that amount of praise which the Quran uh, lathers on us. Uh, so the Quran praises, but also on occasion blames, and we have to put the two together, the, play, the praise together uh, with the blame. Uh, so it, it is possible uh, that uh, some people wrote uh, copies of the Torah, and, and we have the surviving copies and in fact, it's not Muslims who invented this. The prophet Jeremiah, already in the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 8, uh, says that the Torah has been corrupt. 
How can you say we are wise and we have the words of the Lord, whereas the lying pens of the scribes have falsified it? So reads Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 8. Uh, and uh, the, the Quran is basically uh, towing the same line of saying, look, there have been changes in the previous uh, scriptures. Uh, David says, but some of them were faithful, the Quran says, and those faithful ones must have preserved the scriptures. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, Stephen Byington, in his uh, translation of the Bible, wrote an introduction, and in that introduction, he calls to attention what Jeremiah said in chapter 8, verse number 8, and he said, whereas Jeremiah was complaining about the scriptures as they existed in his time, we would be hard-pressed to prove that what we have now are not the same corrupted scriptures which uh, Jeremiah was complaining about. So this is now left for somebody to try and uh, prove. Uh, David mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls. Did you realize, David, that among the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, several versions of the uh, Old Testament were found? Uh, one, there is a prototype of the Masoretic text, that which became the popular reading. But there is also the Septuagint, or, or a proto-Septuagint version. Uh, and uh, there is also the Samaritan version. And another version which is unlike anything else that, that we have come down to us, that we know. So there are four different versions uh, of the Old Testament found at the, uh, at the Dead Sea. The, the, David says, well, the Quran itself says you shouldn't be disbelieving in some parts of the, of the scripture. True. But when it is said to the Jews, you must understand the rhetorical stance of the Quran. And this is one of the points that Sidney Griffith po uh, uh, draws attention to. The Quran has a rhetorical stance. It is actually arguing with people. And in argumentation, you don't always say uh, things uh, as declarations of fact, but you put the opponent on the spot. Think of Jesus, and he's being approached. And they ask him, by whose authority are you doing these things? And he says, okay, tell me about John the Baptist and his baptism. By whose authority is his baptism? His opponents refused to answer and they left. So instead of declaring that he is doing it by the authority of God, he puts the question back to them. They are confounded and they leave. So if we are asking, well, these people who are coming to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they're seeking a judgment from, from him, and they have the Torah, and they claim that the Torah is the word of God, and it has the judgment of God therein. So how could they come to a person that they regard as a false prophet, and they're asking him to give a judgment in their case? So the Quran is saying, how do they come to you? Well, they have the Torah, and in it is the judgment of God probably meaning that they're the ones who say it is the judgment of God, or affirming that the judgment from God on this matter is still there in the Torah, even if there are other passages in the Torah that are actually uh, corrupt. Uh, so it is not that the Quran is making a statement about all of the Torah being uh, intact. So too with the, with the Injil or the Gospel, uh, the Quran is saying, let them judge by that which God has revealed therein. What God has revealed therein, not by all of it necessarily, but by what God has revealed therein. And uh, when uh, David cited Surah 5, verse number 68, he actually uh, confirmed the very point that I'm making, because that verse concludes by saying, وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ That which has been revealed from God to you, which includes the Quran. Thank you. All right, Shabir seems interested in textual variants as if these show that a text has actually been corrupted. That's very interesting because there are textual variants that go back to the very uh, earliest strata of Islam. Uh, Uthman gathered them all together and, and tried to burn them to conceal them, uh, but they still uh, remain in various writings. So let me give you an example, and, and there are plenty, but I'm bringing this one up because anyone who has a copy of the Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran can look this up uh, to read it for yourself. Um, but chapter 33, verse 6 of Yusuf Ali, uh, the prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves, and his wives are their mothers. His wives are their mothers. So, uh, no problem there until you look at the footnote where he talks about other versions of the Quran. Uh, Yusuf Ali adds as the footnote, in some kiras, like that of Ubay ibn Kab, occur also the words, and he is a father of them, which imply his spiritual relationship and connection with the words, and his wives are their mothers. So the Quran that you actually have says, and his wives are their mothers, 
And Ubay points, I mean, uh, uh, Ubay in his Quran has the words, and Muhammad is a father to them. Now, that's called a variant, right? It means if you, if you laid out all the early, uh, the early materials on the Quran that people like Ubay ibn Kaab and Ibn Masud and all these guys had, you would see that there are lots of differences. Do those differences mean that the Quran is corrupted? If you say no, then it doesn't, then it wouldn't mean the same thing to have, uh, then it, it wouldn't mean that the, the Torah or the gospel are corrupted to have these kinds of textual variants. Um, but if you say that accord, if there are textual variants in the manuscripts of the Bible and we affirm the originals, well, guess what? You don't have the originals of the Quran, right? You have, you have what Uthman put out, something close to that, but that's after Uthman went on a burning spree of Quran manuscripts because it was complained to him, hey, we're gonna have all these differences now. Um, so, now, by the way, I don't think that that's the corruption of the Quran because I understand that people are copying things down, people can make mistakes and so on. That's why you have the, uh, the science of textual criticism. My point is, if you're saying that the Bible is corrupt on that basis, then the Quran would be as well. Now, Shabir says that the Quran is called the criterion. So the Quran is the criterion of, uh, of uh, a true inscription. Actually, Surah 3, verses 3 to 4, don't, don't say at all what the criterion is. They don't say the Quran is the criterion. Um, some Muslims have, have argued that this is actually referring to the Psalms. But granting that it is the criterion, um, the Quran also calls the Torah the criterion. So, for instance, uh, chapter 2, verse 53 of the Quran, and remember, we gave Moses the scripture and the criterion between right and wrong. There was a chance uh, for you to be guided aright. Uh, so, the other scriptures are called the criterion as well. Um, Shabir, if you think about the verses that he's given, not one of them, not one of them shows that anything has been corrupted in the Torah and the gospel. He's saying, well, how do I know that the, uh, the good Jews and the good Christians would preserve their text? That's not the point. I'm saying that if you say the Quran saying that there are unfaithful Jews or unfaithful Christians means that scriptures have been globally corrupted, why wouldn't the Quran praising good Jews and good Christians mean the exact opposite? And the point is, the entire position is very strange. It's very strange to say, look at those bad Muslims, therefore, the Quran has been corrupted around the world. Look at those bad Christians, look at those bad Jews, therefore, their scriptures have been corrupted. It's absolutely impossible. I could corrupt this Quran all I want. It would not change the Quran. Can't happen. Um, now, the method that Shabir is using is very interesting to me because you can use this in a different way, right? So the, 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 the Quran over and over again, over and over again, refers to the inspiration of the Torah and the gospel, refers to the preservation of these texts. Baina uh, Yadehi, in its presence, Shabir says it's not inconsistent with the Muslim position. Well, it, it, it is if, you're, if the Quran says, I affirm that. Well, if the Quran doesn't immediately tell you, but you know, I'm only talking about parts of that, then it really sounds like the Quran is affirming the scriptures that we have, and that's, that would be the way to interpret it. Um, but if the Quran is repeatedly saying that we have scriptures, that it's affirming our scriptures, if it doesn't mean that, if the Quran means something different from what it says, well, we've got a problem here, because if you're going to go through the, go through the Quran, Take something that's you know, about some guy writing something and saying you know, this is a prophecy from the Torah and it's not, and that this means that the Torah around the world has been corrupted. You can do that with other scriptures. And what I mean here is the harshest language used of any text in the Quran is not used of the Torah, it's not used of the gospel, it's used of the Quran. What do I mean? Well, chapter 15 of the Quran, verses 89 to 91 and say, surely I am a plain warner, like as we sent down on the dividers those who made the Quran into shreds. That's the Shakir translation. Yusuf Ali translated as, translates it as, so also and such as have made the Quran into shreds as they please. Palmer's translation is more interesting. He says, on the separatists who dismember the Quran. Now, does this say that the Quran has been shredded? Does that mean that the Quran has been corrupted? I don't think so. I don't think that's what it's saying. Why? Because the Quran elsewhere talks about no one being able to change it and so on. Um, so the fact that I could come up with an alternative translation of that uh, means that I probably, I mean, uh, an alternative interpretation, one that doesn't involve corruption, well, that's what, uh, that's what I would do. But 
if I'm to adopt Shabir's method, which is let me go through here and find something that sounds like it's talking about corruption and then use that to reinterpret all of the clear texts. Well, I could do that right now, right? I can say, hey, I don't want to believe in the Quran. Up oh, says right here, the Quran's been shredded. And by the way, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if it had said those who shredded the Torah or those who shredded the gospel, that would be a proof text among Muslims to show you see the Quran affirms the corruption of the Torah and the gospel. But it doesn't say it of the Torah and the gospel, it says it of the Quran. And so it's no proof of anything. It's a very interesting methodology we have here. I only have about a minute, a little over a minute left, but uh, Shabir appeals to Jeremiah 8.8. This is actually something very similar because it talks about the lying pen of the scribes. We actually know um, that Jews back in, the time, in that time were writing commentaries and so on, and they would put out their commentaries as authoritative as well. Uh, so is Jeremiah referring to the corrupt text of the Torah? No, because through the rest of the book of Jeremiah, he refers to the law as they have. So um, Jeremiah 26, 4 through 6, say to them, this is what the Lord says, if you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, and you do not listen to the words of the servants of the prophets, he goes on, right? The rest of the text of Jeremiah presupposes an accurate copy of the Torah. So can he be saying an 8-8 corruption? No. Notice the same pattern. You go to the Quran, find anything that can be remotely interpreted as corruption of the Torah and the gospel, and that's your proof. What about all these texts that, that presuppose inspired, preserved, authoritative word of Allah? Well, we reinterpret those. And we do the same thing with the Bible. Here's a text that we can interpret as corruption of the Torah. Well, that's what it means, corruption of the Torah. What about all the other verses that show that that makes no sense? Well, we don't do that. Uh, interesting methodology. So it's getting uh, very interesting as we go. Uh, let me um, then share some thoughts on what uh, David has presented before us. He responds to my mention that uh, the third surah of the Quran, 78 to 80, um, speaks of the corruption of the previous scriptures. You notice I did say that it's referring initially to their tongues, seven, verse number 78. But then, more to the point, verses number 79 and 80 indicates to Muslims that some of the things mentioned about Jesus in the New Testament could not really be from him. Uh, because in verse number 79, it says that it is not possible for a prophet, basically, uh, to be saying, Take me as they uh, worship me along with God. Uh, and this, the next verse uh, says that it's not possible, basically, for a prophet to be saying to people uh, to take the prophets and angels uh, as, as God beside God. So the indications in the New Testament of Jesus' divinity, uh, Muslims would naturally be cautious about, not because Muslims wanted to invent that idea, but because that idea uh, is, is already there in the Quranic scripture. It's telling Muslims this. So the Quran is saying both things. The Quran is saying that there's a lot of good in the Bible. Muslims should respect uh, the Bible for that reason. Uh, it ha contains uh, revelation from God. It contains judgments from God. It contains light and, and guidance. And at the same time, the Quran is saying, watch out for those passages which have deviated from the original. And yes, the Quran affirms in the same chapter that uh, they are not all the same. The Quran says, La su sawa uh, Among the uh, people of the book, there are some who yet lose that they, they recite the books, uh, the, the, the verses of God uh, in the uh, wee hours of the night, perhaps that's the best way of translating it, or one way of translating it. But uh, many Muslim commentators think that this is a reference to those people from among the Jewish community who had become Muslims, and so they were reciting the ayat of Allah, meaning the Quran itself and not necessarily the previous scriptures. So we do not have a proof here that the previous scriptures had remained intact in all of its parts. Now, David uh, says, well, there are textual variants in the Quran as well. And uh, so, so what does that prove? Well, I, I think he's missing the point here of our topic, and we need to keep our eye on the eight ball. Imagine the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, preaching to people in, in his lifetime. Uh, now, what is he saying to Jews and Christians? That is our question here today. If you say the Quran is his word, then the question is, what is he saying through the Quran to the Jews and Christians? Is he telling them all of your scriptures are intact and 100% authoritative, keep it as you are, stay as you are as Jews and Christians, you don't have to believe in me? Uh, so that is the question that we're addressing here tonight. Now, if 
Muhammad's words themselves, and if his Quran later on becomes, let's say, 100% corrupt, that's not the question. The question is, what would people have understood at the time when he was speaking? Would they have understood that all of the previous scriptures are intact or not? And to know the answer to that question, we have to see what the Quran says. It's, it has nothing to do with later Quranic variants. Uh, but he did say that, yes, even the example that he showed uh, is, is not, does not mean that the Quran is corrupt. And I agree with him, because the, uh, ex, the, the passage here says, and uh, uh, one reciter uh, had a text in which it was written, So the, the original text says, and uh, his wives are like their mothers. And uh, this insertion says, and he is like a father to them. Uh, but that insertion did not survive in our popular reading of the Quran. It was not deemed to be authoritative. It was thought that perhaps this uh, is an interpretive comment from that individual, and it got written in with the text itself, but it's not part of the Quran. But in any case, this has little to do with our topic, because the topic tonight is not whether the Quran has been preserved. The topic is whether the Quran, when it was originally pronounced, whether it said that the previous scriptures are all intact or whether it indicated that previous scriptures may have been changed somehow. And my answer consistently has been, with all of the evidence I've advanced, that there is evidence from the Quran that the previous scriptures have been corrupted. Now, David uh, mentioned hadiths. Uh, so now, instead of saying what the Quran says, now David is saying, well, here's what the Hadith says. Uh, but then, in order to prove that the uh, previous scriptures remain intact, he cited two Hadiths, one from Abu Dawood and one from Tirmidhi. Now, my question to him will be, why don't you cite one from Bukhari? Where, for example, in Bukhari's uh, narrative, it says that Ibn Abbas says, how can you ask the people of the book about their scriptures when your book has informed you uh, that people wrote parts of the previous book with their own hands and then sold it for a trifling price? So let, let's look, if we're going to look at hadith, look at all of them. But our question is not about hadith, it's about the Quran, the Quranic view of the previous uh, scriptures. Now, David says that in response to my point about Furqan criterion referring to the Quran, well, look, the Quran also refers to the Torah as a criterion. But notice how that works. When God revealed the Torah to Moses, assuming that that's what God did, the Quran says that God revealed the book to Moses, and the Torah is referred to as the book of Moses, but never the two are combined in the Quran. The Quran does not specifically say that God revealed the Torah to Moses. I just wanted to make that clarification. But that's not so very important right now. The important thing is that the Torah itself is a criterion for that which went before it. Because if there was ignorance before the Torah, and now uh, the Torah comes as a book of guidance from God, that uh, answers to all of the ignorance from before, and that becomes the criterion for differentiating between truth and falsehood at that time. Now, if the Torah has changed over time, and now the Quran finally has been sent down by God, uh, this becomes now the final criterion. And this now judges everything that came before it and differentiates between the truth and falsehood. Uh, David made the interesting point that uh, the, the Quran should have said immediately, if the Quran is saying there are good things in your Bible, the Quran should have immediately added, but you know there are uh, exceptions to that. But that does not even work even for the Bible. Think about Jesus saying, if anyone divorces his wife and then marries another, he uh, commits adultery with her. Well then, uh, that, that's in Mark, that's in Luke. But Matthew makes an exception, except for adultery. So now, should we insist that all of them should have made the same exception? When, Jesus, when they wrote that Jesus said this, they should have added the exception. Mark should have added it. Luke should have added it at the same time. Or do we interpret Scripture in the light of Scripture? That's what we do for the Bible, and that's what we do for the Quran as well. Scripture in the light of, of Scripture. The Quran says some positive things about the Bible, but also uh, some not-so-savory things. We have to put them all together uh, in, in one. And the Quran in Surah 15 spoke about people who take the Quran into shreds. That could be people who are actually taking parts out of it and giving it a meaning that they want. And I hope that David hasn't actually done the same thing here tonight. As for Jeremiah calling on people to listen to the Scriptures... 
Uh, that, that shows a similar attitude to the Quran. Yes, listen to your scriptures, but at the same time, be aware that the lying pens of scribes have actually falsified some parts of it. Not all of it, so some parts of it are still good. Listen to that. And that, uh, in a nutshell, is what I've been trying to say uh, is the Quranic viewpoint. Thank you all very much. All right, Shabir, uh, towards the end there, said that uh, we have to interpret Scripture in the light of Scripture. That, that's actually been my position uh, all along. When we talk about what the Quran says about the Torah and the Gospel, the clear passages are Allah inspired the Torah and the Gospel. Um, Jews and Christians still had the Torah and the Gospel. Uh, Jews are commanded to judge by the Torah. Christians are commanded to judge by the gospel. We have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand upon the Torah and the gospel. Uh, these are the clear passages. What are the unclear or ambiguous passages? Well, that would be that guy over there wrote, a, wrote something about Muhammad and he's claiming that it's from God. Therefore, the Torah has been corrupted. Does that mean that the Torah has been corrupted? I don't see how. But at the very least, you would have to say that's one interpretation among a lot and the vast majority would not have anything to do with the corruption of the Torah. So if you have clear statements about the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah and the gospel, and other passages which can be interpreted in a lot of ways, most of which have nothing to do with corrupting the text of the Torah and the gospel, you interpret ambiguous passages in the light of clear passages. But when you, when you do that, you walk away saying that the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah and the gospel. Now, Shabir's position is that the Quran affirms certain good things in the Bible, but it also tells you to watch out. Well, the Quran doesn't say watch out at all. The Quran never says watch out for the Torah and the gospel. The Quran does nothing but praise the Torah and the gospel. Let me uh, just add a quote here from uh, a Muslim scholar, uh, Abdullah Said. again, he says, in no verse of the Quran is there a denigrating remark about the scriptures of the Jews and Christians. Instead, there is respect and reverence. Any disparaging remarks were about the people of the book, individuals or groups, and their actions. And that's why Shabir has to take passages that are directed towards look at these people doing these bad things and conclude that your text has therefore been corrupted. But the Quran doesn't criticize the texts. The Quran criticizes people. Uh, the Quran does nothing but praise the texts. Now, if we adopt the method which Shabir laid down, namely interpreting, uh, interpreting scripture in the light of scripture, there isn't one instance in the Quran that criticizes our scriptures. And so the, the two passages that he's quoted have nothing to do at least clearly, about the corruption of our text. And Shabir had to stretch one of them to say, well, uh, you know, this is criticizing Christians here, and so maybe it's they're doing this with the gospel. So notice, nothing clear there, right? Allah claims repeatedly in the Quran that his words are clear. If he says, Jews, you don't need Muhammad, you have the Torah, I interpret that to mean what he's saying there. Um, if he says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein, I assume that Allah means what he says there. Uh, Shabir even uh, says that in 568, it's telling us to go by the Quran because it says, and all the revelation that has come down to you from your Lord, judge by, uh, you, need, you stand upon the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come down to you from your Lord. No, it doesn't. The Quran draws a distinction between the revelation that has come down to the people of the book, and that would include other scriptures like the Psalms and so on, and what has come down to Muslims. That's why it says that Muslims are supposed to say, we believe in the revelation that has come down to us and in the revelation that has come down to you. So the Quran itself draws a distinction there. The Quran is not what has come down to us. Now, given the Quran's repeated declarations uh, that we have the inspired word, the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, why are Muslims so adamant that the Quran affirms the corruption of these texts? Well, it's because they know what's in there. And that's why, you know, notice Shabir said, David, you quoted two hadiths. Why didn't you quote Ibn Abbas on this? Well, first of all, the, the, the sources on Ibn Abbas conflict with each other. You have other, uh, other sources on Ibn Abbas where he affirms no one can change the text. But notice, that's Ibn Abbas. I quoted the two hadiths because it was Muhammad speaking. And I pointed out that in Islam, Muhammad is the greatest interpreter of the Quran, so that when he says, that Jews have the Torah and Christians have the gospel, he's interpreting this in light of what the Quran says, and so Muhammad's agreeing with me. Uh, Ibn Abbas, last time I checked, doesn't get to overrule Allah and Muhammad, especially when the sources on Ibn Abbas contradict each other. And so why, why, given what the Quran says, would Muslims want to say that the books have been corrupted? Well, Shabir has pointed it out. 
uh, our texts disagree with the Quran. And what Muslims eventually realized over time is that uh, either Christians have the word of God or we don't. If we have the word of God, Islam has to be false because Islam contradicts our scriptures. Um, but if we don't have the word of God, Islam is still false because it's affirming our scriptures and saying that we do have the, the true scriptures. So whether the Bible is the word of God or not, Islam turns out to be false. Muslims recognize this, recognize this and they were forced to say that our scriptures have been corrupted. And uh, finally, folks, uh, before we get to your questions, uh, I want to say how delighted I've been here uh, to, to speak before you uh, tonight. You've been a very gracious uh, audience. I thank you for that. And again, I want to thank the people who made it possible for me to come and uh, speak in this uh, church. I feel so honored, uh, and I really love this uh, space. Some of you might be saying a quiet prayer uh, for me at this point. <laughs> Now, uh, David is correct in saying that uh, we should, in, in, uh, we should uh, interpret the ambiguous passages in the light of the clear ones. Uh, and in fact, we need to, inv uh, to uh, understand passages in terms of the clear big picture as well. So what is the big picture? Big picture items. Jesus goes into the uh, temple, he opens the scroll of Isaiah, and he's preaching there. Where is there any such record that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did something with the previous scriptures? If his Quran was saying, look, all your previous scriptures are good, Torah, good, Injil, Bible, all good, why wasn't he preaching from the same scripture? Okay, big picture item. Uh, the Christians have added their New Testament to the Old Testament, to the scriptures that came before it. Why didn't the Muslims add the Quran to the Old and New Testament and say we have now the final uh, testament, like the, the whole book with the Old Testament, New Testament, Final Testament all bound together? Of course, it would have been a big book, but the, the major issue here is that the Quran made a clear distinction between itself and the previous scriptures. And Muslims knew that from the very inception. That's why they scurried about to collect the pieces of written material about the Quran, but they did not try to join that to the previous scriptures. And, and the Bible became an interesting store of, of some information for Muslim commentators on the Quran to fill out the biblical stories, but not to overtake the Quranic passages. And so the Quran remained in this position of prime importance and distinction in the minds of Muslims. So that's the big picture item. So as for Abdullah Said, I've read his article in which he defends the view that the Torah and the Injil at the time of the Quranic revelation remained in Intact, but I'm not convinced by his view, and I've mentioned many of the reasons here in what preceded. Uh, now, uh, David repeated that the Quran was not meant for the Jews and Christians. So the Quran means the Jews have the Torah, the Christians have their gospel, and Muslims will have the Quran. Each community has its own book. But he ignored what I said during the debate. I cited Surah 5, that's Surah Al-Ma'idah, the 15th verse and the 19th verse. And I cited the uh, fourth chapter of the Quran, that's Surah Al-Nisa, the 47th uh, verse, in which it is very clear that the Quran is making a demand on the Jews and Christians that they now have to believe in this book in addition to whatever else God had revealed to them uh, previously. Now, he said that uh, we, we shouldn't uh, cite Ibn Abbas because it is the Prophet Muhammad who is of prime importance, uh, but there is also a question about the reliability of the information. And it is true that there are two different narr narrations about Ibn Abbas, but one is in a numbered hadith in Bukhari which takes precedence as opposed to another commentary in the same, uh, in the same book. Uh, and it is also important to notice that Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi are not the most important and authoritative records of the uh, uh, sayings of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. So really, David is building his case on materials which are not so dependable. What is more dependable are the big picture items which I mentioned and also the Quranic statements which I've also uh, mentioned. Sidney Griffith uh, is a scholar. So why should he cite Abdullah Saeed and I cite Sidney Griffith? Sidney Griffith uh, is, is a scholar of, uh, of the Muslim tradition. Uh, though himself, he himself does not appear to be a Muslim, it seems to me that he is a fair, unbiased person, and he thinks that the Quran clearly uh, speaks of the corruption of the text 
uh, of the Bible prior to the Quran. Uh, now, let's put them all together and see what has been happening here. It seems, as I said previously, that there's been a long trend in scholarship where non-Muslims, especially Christians, writing about the Quran have been saying that the Quran confirms the Bible. And that material has become so numerous that even I myself was inclined to be convinced by that view until on later consideration I realized that that view is incorrect and uh, my inclination on, in this regard came to be confirmed now uh, by Sid Sidney Griffith. So I think that puts it all uh, together. Now, finally, David says that if they have the word of God, then Islam is wrong. It's interesting that he didn't try to prove that they still have the word of God. Thank you. Gentlemen, here in just a minute, we have a, a list of questions. If anybody else has any questions, please go ahead and text those up. Um, do, do either of you need a chance to stretch or take a drink or anything? You ready to get into these questions here? Okay, <laughs> take just a moment. I'm gonna get the software reset. We'll give you about a minute and a half each to respond to the question. Sure. And some of the questions are directed to you, David, or to you, Shabir, and you'll each be given an opportunity to respond appropriately. Gentlemen, um, this question is addressed to both of you, and let's just keep the pattern that, David, you go first, Shabir second, um, for sake of being fair, I think. Um, where exactly in the scripture does it say that John the Baptist is being said by Jesus that John is better than Jesus? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in Matthew's uh, gospel, uh, Jesus uh, speaks about John the Baptist and says, uh, uh, of all of those born of women, there has risen none greater than John the Baptist. This is the exact statement, and I believe it is in Matthew's gospel, but you can look it up yourself. Of all of those born of women, there has risen none greater than John the Baptist. And since Jesus was already born of a woman by all agreement, uh, and uh, he's saying this, and there has arisen none greater than John the Baptist, that means so far, no one greater than John the Baptist, obviously not even Jesus. And then, to add to that, the, the point is that John the Baptist says, after me will come one who is greater than I, uh, so great that I am not fit to stoop down and untie his shoelaces. That's who I don't have the exact biblical reference for, but you can check it up yourself. So one to come after John the Baptist is greater than John the Baptist, and Jesus is saying that John the Baptist is greater than Jesus. So the one to come later is greater than John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is greater than Jesus. Therefore, the one to come later is greater than Jesus, and therefore is not Jesus, someone else. Who is that someone uh, for Muslims? If you were to use this uh, principle of Pesher and look at the whole situation, you will see that this is uh, the person here. Muhammad. Yeah, let's just say Christians interpret those texts very, very differently. Um, when Jesus says that uh, among those born of women, there is not arisen a greater than John the Baptist, um, we don't take that as meaning that Jesus isn't greater than John the Baptist. We take that as meaning that Jesus is more than a man. In other words, those who have their origin um, strictly from a woman versus someone who is uh, who existed before him uh, as far as this referring to someone to come after Jesus I'll just go ahead and read what 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 we have from John um, got enough time uh, so this is gospel of John uh, chapter 124 now they had been sent from the Pharisees they asked him and said to him uh, why then are you baptizing if you are not Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet John answered them saying I baptize in water but among you stands one whom you do not know it is notice stands among you one you do not know it is he who comes after me the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie so it's not talking about Muhammad 600 uh, 600 years later it says, these things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. So I would say that John and Jesus both understood the passage in the exact same way that Christians understand it, but not the way Shabir understands it. Again, uh, addressed to both of you, the comment or the question or the comment that then leads to the question is, I've encountered some Muslims that are fully trusting of the content of the book of Barnabas and what it reveals. Why in turn is the New Testament met with such skepticism? Why in turn is the New Testament? 
Why, in oh, turn, is the New Testament met with such skepticism? Um, I've, I've never heard what Shabir has to say about the, the Gospel of Barnabas, but, but considering it was written uh, more than a thousand years after the time of Jesus and the, the, the manuscripts are in Spanish and Italian and scholars across the board regard it as a rather obvious forgery, I'm assuming Shabir uh, agrees with all of that. Um, but this was written geared to, uh, uh, to defend an Islamic interpretation of Jesus, and that's why it's, it's more uh, it's more popular. So if, if you were a Muslim, if you were a Muslim and you just read the Gospel of Barnabas and then you read the four New Testament Gospels, you'd say, yeah, I want to go with that Gospel of Barnabas. But you've got you to dig a little deeper and actually look into the historical, uh, look into the historical background that the Gospel of Barnabas is filled with details that, uh, that just can't be historic. It talks about them sailing to Nazareth and so on. Um, so we know the origin of that book as far as why it's popular and why the New Testament is less popular. Um, that's true at, at, at sort of the, the, the popular level. In other words, some Muslims who haven't studied these issues like the Gospel of Barnabas more, but um, at the more scholarly level and uh, among Muslim debaters, then we're, we're usually dealing with, with the New Testament. What is called the Gospel of Barnabas today is a document that was discovered in the Middle Ages, something like the 16th century, by a certain Fra Marino, uh, who was an Italian, and then he embraced Islam. Uh, the, the document itself was uh, discovered to be in the Italian language, and then subsequently translated into English by Lonsdale and Laura Rag. This gospel became popular among Muslims because, uh, among other things, it says that uh, instead of Jesus being crucified on the cross, someone was made to look like Jesus, and that one was crucified. And uh, it also has Jesus explicitly referring to a person coming after him whose name is Muhammad. Uh, but despite this popular acclaim among Muslims, uh, I did not come across any historical defense of this as the original uh, gospel of Barnabas. In fact, there, it is known that there was a gospel called the Gospel of Barnabas uh, because uh, a fourth century decree uh, uh, listing banned books lists one of the books as the Gospel of Barnabas. And Barnabas, we know, to have been one of the important uh, early Christians. Uh, so did he write a gospel, and is this the one? Well, we, we cannot trace this historically through the ages, and for this reason, I prefer not to make reference to this gospel of Barnabas as being supportive of the Muslim views, uh, because for Muslims, uh, we have a very strict system of identifying what comes from the previous prophets, and uh, the gospel of Barnabas does not meet those strict uh, requirements. Thank you. Gentlemen, what does the Quran say about Jesus Christ? Who was he? Was he God or was he a prophet? From the Quran, it is very clear that Jesus was not God. In fact, part of my, much of my presentation went into those passages of the Quran, Surah 3, verses 79 and 80, uh, which insist that uh, Jesus could not have uh, told people to worship him. Other passages can be brought to bear in this as well. For example, Surah 5, verse number 116, and forward from there. Uh, surah 4, verses 171, and, uh, and the verses following that. So the Quran is very clear that there is only one God, and the Quran is saying... Do not say the word three. Uh, just say one, one God, that's, that's enough. And uh, do not attribute divinity either to Jesus or to his mother, a possible reference to the, um, uh, those from the Catholic uh, persuasion who may think of Mary uh, as uh, having uh, some special title like Theotokos, uh, mother of God. So the Quran insists on the other hand that Jesus was a prophet. And prophet, as you know by definition, the English word prophet, many think prophet means one who sees ahead of time. But that's not what the word means. Prophet in Greek actually means uh, one who speaks on behalf of another. It corresponds to the uh, Hebrew Nabi, which uh, refers to one who gives information about the future. So too in, in Arabic, it's one who informs Naba'a. And uh, the, a prophet, therefore, is one who speaks on behalf of God, and therefore not God himself. So the Quran insists that Jesus, on whom be peace, was a human with limitations in his power and knowledge. And I believe that the New Testament bears evidence to that as well. Yes, uh, Jesus in the Quran is, is very interesting in, um, in that 
Muslims agree with us on certain things that no one else agrees with us on, right? Uh, atheists don't agree with us that Jesus was born of a virgin and that he performed miracles and so on. But uh, in the Quran, Jesus is born of a virgin. He lives the most miraculous life we have uh, a record of. Uh, the Quran calls him the Messiah. And there's even a miraculous end where uh, he's, he's rescued uh, towards the end. Um, so there, there are a lot of interesting uh, parallels, and of course the, the, the areas where we disagree just happen to be on the fundamentals of the New Testament gospel, the, 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 the core teachings of the New Testament gospel, Jesus died on the cross for sins, rose from the dead, and now you submit to him as Lord, which the Quran denies uh, these things about him. Uh, but, but, but what I find interesting is that Jesus, even in Islam, is so radically different from everyone else. In, in Christianity, it makes sense that Jesus is the one who's born of a virgin, that he lives the most miraculous life in history, and that he's the one who inaugurates the resurrection of the dead. In Islam, Jesus is born of a virgin, unlike everyone else. He lives the most miraculous life uh, in the Quran, uh, unlike anyone else, and Allah even rescues him, as opposed to many other prophets who are killed according to the Quran. And so the question is, why this guy? Why? Why? Is Jesus so different? And all a Muslim can really say is, well, that's just what Allah wanted. Uh, but th that picture of Jesus being different from everyone else uh, does seem to fit better with, uh, with the Christian view. David, this question was asked to be addressed to you, but I'd love to hear uh, both of you. The the question writer says, according to me, the Bible has been changed as the Quran addresses. However, how can you prove that the Bible has not been changed since there's almost a thousand different Bibles with different stories? Um, I, I don't know where these uh, numbers are coming from. If you say there are uh, a thousand manuscripts or something like that, that would make sense. There, there are far more than a thousand uh, manuscripts. When you say there are a thousand Bibles, there's, there seems to be a... Uh, very misguided view that there, you know, there's this Bible and you go and it, it, it's completely different. It's, it doesn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It has, you know, Bob, Jim, you know, and so on. It, it's just completely different Bibles. Uh, that's not how it works. Here's the situation. You have lots of manuscripts. You have lots of manuscripts. There are over, there are close to 6,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek. And then you have uh, plenty in Latin and other languages. Um, and what, what textual critics do is they line them up and they examine differences because in any book copied by human beings, whether it's the Quran or whether it's the, the Torah, or the gospel, uh, scribes are going to make mistakes, but you can usually spot them. They're us the vast majority are spelling differences, like the, the most common one I think is, is spelling John with one N or two Ns. Um, so, this, this thousand different Bibles, if you think that means that there are these thousand just completely different Bibles, that's just nonsense. Um, you have textual variants, um, but even critical scholars will acknowledge that no uh, major New Testament doctrine is affected by the variants. And so uh, you're dealing with what you have right here, right? These are, these are critical editions of the New Testament. Uh, to me, the problems uh, are many with regards to the New Testament and its manuscripts. If, if we look at the 6,000 manuscripts of which David spoke, no two of them are exactly alike. That means that errors are so many in them as to make every one distinct from, from the other one. And if you think of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, preaching in his day, when people had these many manuscripts and every one is different from the other, you can imagine that many Christians might have been thinking some of the positive things the Quran says about our scripture, we must wonder if uh, our scripture really is like that. Because it's not like today you come to church and your neighbor is reading the same uh, New King James Version of the Bible uh, that, that you have uh, under your arm. Uh, in those days, uh, everyone has got something different. Uh, the ending of the gospel according to Mark has been a, an interesting problem because Mark chapter 16 verse number 8 uh, ends with the women fleeing from the tomb saying, to nothing, saying nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And uh, it, uh, people rush to fill out this ending. So there's a shorter ending, there's a long longer ending, then there are some manuscripts that combine the two endings, then the freer Logion in Washington uh, puts another insertion into the longer ending. Some people were doing all kinds of things with the, with the Christian uh, scriptures, and these were good people wanting to uh, circulate the scriptures, but they made changes. Most of the changes, of course, were done at the time of writing the New Testament documents themselves, and so we find many discrepancies between the four Gospels, each one in its own way trying to represent Jesus. Some 
misrepresenting him. Thank you. This series of questioning might have some overlap, so, um, but I want, I want to at least honor the people who asked these questions. Uh, what translations did Muhammad refer to when citing the Torah and the Gospels? Was Muhammad able to read Greek, Hebrew, or other languages that the scriptures may have been available at that time? So, the, the reports which have come down to us in traditional Muslim literature show that the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace was not trained to read or write, and the Quran seems to make reference to that when it refers to him as a Nabiul Ummi, the unlettered prophet, in a verse we cited already in our presentation, Surah 7, verse number 157. Uh, the uh, Muslim traditions also assert that uh, Jews and Christians used to come read the scriptures to the Muslims in their original languages and then tell Muslims in Arabic what the scriptures uh, said. And so that information about those scriptures uh, apparently were secondhand. And this is part of the surprise. How indeed does the Quran give us such a detailed knowledge of the Christian scriptures uh, such that the Quran can basically rewrite the stories and get rid of all of the problems? For example, the serpent speaks to the woman. And we know that serpents don't speak. Uh, and, and it's not asserted that this was done miraculously. It seems that whoever wrote the Bible thought, oh yeah, serpents uh, speak. Uh, but the Quran says Satan whispered uh, to them. It, no mention of the serpent here. And it's interesting that the Quran is making these corrections. Uh, the, the Bible says that the woman was created from the rib of the man, as if the woman's creation was secondary in God's plan. Uh, and uh, this is because the man could not be happy with any of the animals. But the Quran says from the beginning, God created them both. And in fact, if one wanted to argue, one could say, because nafs is grammatically feminine, maybe the woman was created first, and God knows best. All right, well, uh, seventh century Arabia was an oral culture. Um, you, had, uh, you had Jews there, you had a smaller number of Christians, uh, monks and so on, and so uh, we know uh, from Muslim sources that Muhammad uh, got into conversations um, with these people. Um, but yes, Muhammad would not have been uh, known biblical Greek or, or Hebrew or anything, so this would have been, uh, this would have been uh, you know, sharing, sharing stories uh, around a campfire type deal. Um, what, what's interesting, though, is, is the Quran's view of languages, because Muhammad is accused repeatedly in the Quran of copying his stories from other people. Uh, but when, it's, when it's, it's pointed out, we know who he's getting these stories from, the Quran itself says, but that person's tongue is foreign while this is in Arabic. So Muhammad can't be copying the story from this guy because he's not a native Arab, whereas Muhammad is writing in Arabic. You know, this... this this very odd view of language you know, versus the New Testament, which is, you know, it starts off translating into Greek, the language of the people um, that, that, was, that was popular at the time. It was the English of the time. And so uh, very interesting because it would be like me, you know, coming up and saying, here, I wrote a book called War and Peace. And you say, that's just like, you know, that, that's just like the Russian version. I say, no, that's in Russian. This is in English. Can't be translated. So, uh, so no, it, it, in Islam, it seems to be Jews have their revelation in their language and Christians have theirs in theirs and, and Muslims have, their, have ours in, in Arabic. Another question that came in says, um, Question number seven, why would Muhammad be willing to accept the Torah and the gospel? Was he aware of their contents, especially passages that show that Jesus is God or that contradict passages of the Quran? Um, here I will tell you my belief. Um, you want to start the clock? Let's start that, just in case. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you my belief, which, which is how I make sense of the various um, passages, because the Quran is affirming um, our scriptures and yet is condemning belief in the deity of Christ and uh, his death for sins and so on. So uh, again, this is an oral culture. Jews have scriptures. Christians have scriptures. 
uh, but a lot of stories are just, are just told back and forth. Um, I believe Muhammad was convinced that he's a prophet and that he is the prophet for the Arabs and that he is affirming these other scriptures and that he's one of the many prophets that, uh, that Allah has sent out into the world and that he's the prophet for the Arabs. Uh, as far as differences of doctrine, um, since Muhammad's not reading these texts, and we know that he repeatedly accuses uh, Jews and, and others of, of twisting things and of getting things wrong. I believe that Muhammad really thought Christians have reliable scriptures from God and that Jews really have reliable scriptures from God and that this is the position of the Quran and that as far as differences, when he sees Christians talking about the Trinity um, and he sees Christians talking about the deity of Christ, I think he's, he's assuming that this isn't based in the text. This is just what people are saying. And we find this in the Quran in chapter 9, verse 30, when it says that Christians are imitating those who disbelieved before. We're imitating disbelievers by saying Jesus is the Son of God. So he thinks that's where we're getting this belief when actually it, it comes from our text. It's all over our texts. Of course, this is one of the central questions of our debate because if, as David would assert, that the Prophet Muhammad did not know that his Quran was different from the Bible and he thought his Quran was teaching the same things as the Bible and he's approving of the Bible and only Muslims later on discovered that the Quran was different from the Bible when they came to read the Bible for the first time, then what are we to make of the fact that the Quran is denying the sonship of Jesus, uh, the divine sonship that is of Jesus in whatever form, whether begotten or adopted or whatever. Uh, didn't anybody inform the Prophet Muhammad that, wait a minute, you know what? The Christian scriptures do actually say it. And he could have changed his story throughout the 23 years of his career, but he kept preaching the same thing from the beginning to the end. Jesus is not the Son of God. He is a servant and Messiah, uh, the messenger of God, uh, but not God himself, not the Son of God. So that means he knew that his Quran is different from the previous scriptures. Now, where did the previous scriptures get this idea in, uh, for, in to, to say that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, from things like the Gospel according to John. Notice uh, when we talked about John the Baptist, Baptist. I was referring to the Synoptic Gospels, and then David came and referred to the Gospel according to John. What's John doing with the previous stories? John is changing the stories and making Jesus appear bigger and greater. This is why in John's Gospel, Jesus is definitely greater than John the Baptist. But in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it looks like John the Baptist was greater than Jesus. This question um, listed as number 12 in my list here says, what does the Quran have to say about the Trinity? So we're like musical chairs, you know, he goes first, I go first, and so on. Okay, <laughs> who's on first? Uh, so uh, the, the Quran in the fourth chapter says, uh, do not say three, uh, you desist from that, it is better for you. From the Quranic perspective, there is only one God. And the Quran is saying, this has been the teaching of all of the previous prophets from uh, Adam, whom the Quran, Muslims believe to be a prophet, though the Quran does not specifically say so. Uh, for, for Muslims, this is the same teaching throughout history. There there's only one God, and you should worship that one God. Don't associate any partners with him. And uh, the Quran, therefore, sees the Trinity as a later deviation. David mentioned Surah 9, verse number 30, which says that they are following the, the teachings of those who disbelieved of old. So the Quran seems to be classifying this as an old sort of mythology that Christians somehow came to adopt. And the Quran is calling on Christians lovingly, please leave that alone. Say that there is only one God, because this is the original teaching. And of course, uh, the Quran Quran is uh, confirmed by a study of the uh, previous scriptures, because when we look at uh, the Old and New Testament, we see that that is the teaching of the previous prophets, even of Jesus. In Mark chapter 12, a man comes and asks, what is the greatest of all of the commandments? And Jesus repeats what we know is the Shema Israel from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And the man says to him, you are right, teacher, there is only one God, and besides him there is no other. And that's clear that the one God is not the Jesus to whom the man was speaking. Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the Quran denies the doctrine of the Trinity and the sonship of Jesus. 
and why I would disagree with Shabir as far as uh, whether Muhammad knew what was in the Christian scriptures is that the Quran just doesn't get right what we believe. Um, in other words, when it seems to be describing what we believe, when it's responding to our beliefs, it's, it's not what Christians believe. Um, so Surah 5 verse 116 is the closest we get to a description of the Trinity. This is after being told, don't believe in the Trinity, don't say, don't say three. Uh, the closest we get to a description is chapter 5, verse 116, and behold, Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to men, worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of Allah? He will say, glory to thee, never could I say what I had no right to say. So after telling us to deny the Trinity, the, the, the closest we get to an explanation is a Trinity made up of God, Jesus, and Mary who just work closely together. Now, I can understand a 7th century caravan trader Hearing Christians talk about God and Mary and Jesus and Trinity and thinking that's what we mean by the Trinity. I can understand Muhammad getting that wrong. I don't understand God getting it wrong, right? Uh, in other words, if, if God's going to respond to what we believe, it should be, here's the doctrine of the Trinity and here's why it's wrong. Same thing with the sonship of, of Christ. The Quran says, um, uh, how can Allah have a son when he has no wife? Well, no Christian has ever believed that this is a, a matter of physical procreation. And so when these are the responses of the Quran, it's uh, difficult to take them seriously as the word of God. Gentlemen, do both of you have a copy of the Bible with you? There was a question related to um, John chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, that I'd love for you to have the opportunity to respond to, but I want to make sure that you have a copy there so that you can see it. Um, that question asks, and it was primarily directed to you, David, but I'd love to hear both of your responses. Um, can you explain in detail to us who this verse of the Bible is referring to in this uh, this passage. Uh, in detail, in a minute? And a half? Yeah, 90 <laughs> seconds. I mean, just, you know, <laughs> knock it out of the park. Uh, what, what verses did you say? John 5, 19 through 21. Okay, well... Uh, and l let me give you... Why don't you go ahead and read it for us, and then we'll okay. start the clock after that so that we all have a chance to hear... Um, being therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing, and the father will show him greater works than these so that you may marvel. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son also gives life to whom he wishes. All right, so the question is, who's that talking about? Jesus. There's not a lot of detail required, but I can go ahead and explain the passage, which is actually very interesting. Uh, Muslims often quote this passage where Jesus says of himself he can do nothing and say, you see there, that's, that means he's a prophet. If you actually look at what he's responding to, uh, not so much. Um, in verse 17, Jesus is working on the Sabbath and they say, uh, they, they respond, how are you working on the Sabbath? And he says, my father's working now and I myself am working also. You see, the, the Jewish rabbis had said that God is the one who continues working even on the Sabbath, because he's sustaining the universe. And then Jesus says, well, I get to do that sort of thing as well. And then so they accuse him of claiming to be another God. They accuse him of claiming to be equal with God. So Jesus is a separate deity, according to them. Jesus corrects this interpretation by saying, what are you talking about? Of myself, I can do nothing. In other words, separate from the Father, as some sort of separate being, I, I, I couldn't do anything. Um, so, but then he claims to be, uh, he, he, he fills us in on who he really is, but he says that he's the one who judges the dead and he's the one who raises the dead. And he concludes, because we stopped at verse 21, let me give you the reason why he says this. He says, for not even the father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the son so that all will honor the son even as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Jesus says you have to honor him the same way you honor the father. The only way you would honor the son, the way you honor the father, is if they have the same nature and attributes. That's the only way you would honor someone as you honor God.
to, to me, uh, Jesus, on whom be peace, uh, preached that he was a, a human being, a servant, and a prophet of God, and that comes out clearly in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But now John gives us a different impression about who Jesus was. How is it that Jesus doesn't speak like this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, and Luke, but only in John? See, this is a later story. Uh, Mark, Matthew, and Luke were the earlier Gospels, John written later. And you can see that in the decade that followed uh, from the writing of the previous uh, uh, Gospels to now this one, the story about Jesus has changed. It's like a snowball. The more you roll it around, the bigger it gets. The story about Jesus was being uh, you know, moved around from, by word of mouth from one person to another, and it's like a fish that was caught, and every time the story is retold, the fish gets bigger. So Jesus gets bigger in the story. He becomes greater uh, than a human being, and he starts to uh, achieve a status uh, of, of something of divinity. But though, in John's Gospel, he's still not God. And this is where I think uh, uh, David has actually stretched uh, uh, things a bit in his interpretation. Because in John's gospel, clearly Jesus is saying the Father is greater than I. So for the Trinity to work, you have to have three persons who are co-equal and co-eternal. If one is greater than the other, you don't have a Trinity. And uh, it is clear in John's gospel that there is only one true God, the one to whom Jesus was speaking. That's in John chapter 17, verse 3. Even in John chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus is called a begotten God. That means he's not the almighty God. Gentlemen, we want to ask you one more question, and then in, in honor and respect for all who are here, there's a prayer time a little bit later tonight for our Muslim friends, and we want to honor you and respect you. So we're going to ask one last question, and then I'll have some closing comments. Um, let me read that off your screen here. Was Muhammad's name mentioned in the gospel, and do Christians have to follow his teachings? Uh, Muhammad's name is not mentioned in, in the Gospels we, as we have them now. Uh, the Quran says that Jesus had preached to his people saying, one will come after me, Ismuhu Ahmed, whose name is Ahmed. And Ahmed in Arabic uh, comes from the same root as the word uh, Muhammad, meaning somebody who is uh, praised. And Muslims uh, think that uh, this uh, is uh, an equivalence, that when Jesus spoke of Ahmed, he was spoke, speaking about our prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, as depicted in the Quran. Now, in the Gospels, Gospels, uh, obviously Jesus has been taken as the be-all and end-all. Everything from the Old Testament was interpreted to make Jesus the be-all and end-all. So for the writers of the New Testament, there is no prophet to come after Jesus. But that doesn't mean that that was the fact, and that doesn't mean that that's what Jesus himself preached. In fact, we are finding clues in the New Testament that Jesus may have spoken about someone to come after him. We've already seen that John the Baptist was speaking about someone to come after himself who is greater than both he and, uh, and Jesus uh, at the same time. Uh, so uh, did Jesus Jesus speak about somebody? Yes. Uh, Jesus apparently spoke about a paraclete, and uh, in Syriac, if this was written without any vowels, it would be paraclutus, or could be paraclutus, which means the same Ahmed, one who possibly is praiseworthy. But even if we take the Greek word paraclete, and uh, we analyze the statements carefully in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, it looks like this is pointing to another human being. John chapter 14, verse 26, specifically says the Holy Spirit, but that is is thought by some to be a later corruption. All right, well, uh, since we're going to this passage, uh, very interesting. So in, in John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says, uh, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, paraclete here. There's, there's no uh, manuscript that, uh, uh, that says paraclutos. Um, that he may be with you forever, that is the spirit of truth. So Jesus immediately clarifies who he's talking about. He's talking about the spirit of truth. Now, why is this interesting? Well, if you go over to uh, who sends him, uh, John chapter 16, verse seven, Jesus says, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So, you Muslims, you believe that Jesus sent Muhammad? Jesus is the one who sent, sent Muhammad? Who's the one who sent Muhammad? That's Allah, right? All right, well, Jesus says he's the one who sends the helper. If I go away, I will send him. So if Jesus is the one who sends the helper, the helper sent by Jesus, according to this passage, if you say the helper is Muhammad, and Muhammad is sent by Allah, well, guess what? If 
the helper is sent by Jesus and Muhammad is sent by Allah and the helper is Muhammad, who would that make Jesus? If the helper is sent by Jesus and Muhammad is sent by Allah and you're saying that the helper is Muhammad, who would that make Jesus? That would make Jesus Allah. So be careful how you use these passages. Don't touch that mic. <laughs> Friends, thank you so much for coming tonight. I want to um, just thank you for being a part of this audience. Thank you for your questions. We got um, overwhelmed with questions, which is awesome. And so what we're going to do for both of these gentlemen is give them that document so that in their uh, opportunities on social media and in other platforms, they'll have your questions that help them do this kind of dialogue uh, with a more informed mind and a, and a better understanding of maybe where you were tonight and so they can answer those questions a little better either through social media or through their next debate. Again, just thank you so much for being our guest here tonight and thank you to you gentlemen for your efforts. Good night.